Okay. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, it is my pleasure to open the IEA's uh, webinar on e-methane, which aims to provide an assessment of the challenges and opportunities related to the development of international e-methane uh, value chains. Uh, today's webinar is part of the, uh, the IEA's Low Emission Gases Work Program, which has been developed to closely monitor market developments in this sphere and facilitate dialogues uh, between the emerging producers and consumers. Uh, this work is supported by the uh, Clean Energy Transitions Program, uh, CTP, the IEA's uh, flagship initiative to transform the world's energy systems to achieve a secure and sustainable future for all. CTP uh, seeks to provide uh, countries with uh, valuable, actionable insights and advice that can help drive change. Uh, CTP also supports international clean energy collaboration in many areas, such as the G20, G7, COP, and others. Uh, E-methane has the potential to contribute to the uh, decarbonization of gas networks without the need for retrofitting existing gas infrastructure, such as the LNG receiving terminals, LNG tankers, gas pipelines, and uh, consumer gas equipment. Moreover, E-methane could enable the coupling of future methane and hydrogen networks and as such, facilitate their system integration. The uh, complex value chain underpinning the production of e-methane translates into relatively high investment costs and operational expenses, which highlights the need for further technological development and policy support. So today's webinar aims to identify policy options to enable the establishment of viable business models and facilitate the dialogue between the emerging suppliers and buyers. I have the pleasure to welcome uh, Ryota Kuzuki, uh, Division Head at the uh, Japan Gas Association, uh, Sara Kujala, the CEO of Nordic Rain Gas, and Yves uh, de Verkamen, the Chief Commercial Officer of TES, as well as uh, Gerge Molna, uh, the gas analyst at the International Energy Agency. So I wish you a fruitful discussion today. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, Keisuke. Dear colleagues, um, good morning, good afternoon, depending on from where you are joining us today. My name is Gerge Molnar. I'm a gas analyst at the International Energy Agency, and it is my great pleasure to be your host for today's um, webinar. Um, as you can see, we have quite a pegged agenda. Um, we will start with a brief introductory um, presentation on the concept of emitane, which will then be followed by uh, by the panelist presentations. As mentioned by Director Sadamori, we have a wonderful uh, lineup of uh, speakers, including uh, Mr. Kuzuki from the Japan Gas Association, who will give us uh, the perspective of Japan, a country which is really at the forefront of advancing emitane value chains. Then Mr. Berkamen uh, will share with us the view of an international player which has a global portfolio of emitane projects. And uh, Ms. Kuyala, the Chief Executive Officer of Nordic Rand Gas, uh, will present on the prospects of e-methane in Northern Europe, which is indeed emerging as a key market for e-methane. So obviously, one question we are looking at today is what role for e-methane in a net zero future and what are the key challenges and opportunities along the emerging e-methane value chains. But before diving into today's presentation, please allow me to say a couple of words about the IA's Low Emissions Gases Work Program. We set up this work program about um, two years ago um, to enhance our analysis on the short and medium term developments related to low emission gases. We follow a technology neutral approach uh, with all low emission gases being considered, um, including biomethane, low emissions hydrogen, 
and of course, eMethane. The work program aims to enhance market transparency, provide guidance on the system integration of low emission gases, and promote the producer-consumer dialogue. And one um, reason why we are looking so closely to low emission gases is because we expect that their deployment will accelerate over the medium term. In our latest forecast, the supply of low emission gases is expected to more than double by 2027, translating into an increase of almost 16 BCM in absolute terms. Europe and North America are set to drive the strong growth and to contribute for around 70% of the overall expansion. And as you can see on the graph, the majority of that will be supported by biomethane and low emissions hydrogen, although we see that there is also some room for emethane more towards the end of the decade. This slide shows us a simplified scheme of emethane production. Emethane is essentially produced through a two-step process. First, low emissions electricity is converted by electrolysis into hydrogen, which is then reacted with a carbon source to obtain emethane. In order to consider emethane as a low emission gas, CO2 needs to be of biogenic origin or sourced via direct air capture. A commercial proposition for carbon neutral emethane could also consider the use of CO2 captured at industrial or power plants and offset through carbon credits. Now, of course, emethane is perfectly interchangeable with natural gas, and as such, it could play a significant role in decarbonizing existing gas networks without the need for retrofitting. And similarly to natural gas, emethane can be stored in underground storage sites. It can be also liquefied and make use of the existing LNG infrastructure. And as such, it could enable the development of long distance rail and support the decarbonization of maritime transport. But of course, emethane has its own challenges. Emethane production uh, presents substantial efficiency losses. More than half of the primary energy is lost during the two-step conversion process. And of course, its production would require the development of a separate carbon value chain and emission accounting system. The complex value chain underpinning the production of emethane means that both investment costs and operational expenses are relatively high. Current emethane production costs are estimated to be in the range of 50 to $200 per MMBTU when using biogenic CO2. This is four to 15 times higher um, than the current Asian spot energy prices. Under our announced pledges scenario, we see significant scope for production cost reductions, moderating down to a range of 30 to $80 per MMBTU by 2030, which is still significantly higher than natural gas prices or low emission hydrogen costs. And this highlights the need for further technological development and policy support, including through a closer dialogue <clears throat> between future producers and consumers. Now, this scheme is a bit more complex than the previous ones, and it shows us how the scale up of low emission gases will transform our existing gas system. Production will become more decentralized, gas quality is more diverse, and supply flexible. So in this context, emethane can play a crucial role in the system integration of low emission gases while enhancing the seasonal and short-term flexibility of the overall gas system. Emethane would enable the coupling of future methane and hydrogen networks. So for instance, surplus hydrogen could be converted into emethane before injected into the methane system. And while acting as a bridge between the two networks, emethane will also provide new trading opportunities and lead to more efficient distribution of gas flows. Emethane has also wider storage options compared with hydrogen. Besides salt caverns, it could be also stored in porous formations or in energy storage tanks, options which are not available at the moment for 
hydrogen. Hence, e-methane could play a key role in meeting seasonal or short-term energy demand swings. The scale-up of e-methane will also require strong policies on the demand side. In fact, demand creation will be absolutely crucial to support final investment decisions in e-methane production facilities, and Japan is very much leading those efforts. The country's sixth strategic energy plan set a target for e-methane to account for 1% of gas supply in existing networks by 2030, with its share rising to 90% by 2050. And Mr. Kuzuki will give us an in-depth review of e-methane developments in Japan just in a couple of minutes. This map shows us a non-exhaustive list of e-methane projects or all around the globe. In Northern Europe, the e-methane landscape is very much dominated by Finland, and Ms. Kujala will speak about those projects in greater detail later on today. And we also see that Japanese utilities have been very actively exploring the feasibility of e-methane projects together with energy exporting countries, including Australia, the United States, and Peru. And while the number of final investment decisions remains rather limited, global emitting production could reach over 1 BCM by 2030, based on the projects which are currently being proposed. And we also see that energy exporters account for around 80% of the potential emitting production by 2030, highlighting the perfect match between emitting and the existing energy infrastructure. Uh, to sum up uh, a few key takeaways, um, we see that um, low emission gases are set for a very rapid deployment um, in the coming years. They are expected to more than double by 2027, but still further efforts are required to reach the ambitious targets set by governments. Emethane, which is perfectly interchangeable with natural gas, could indeed play a significant role in decarbonizing existing gas networks without the need for retrofitting. However, the complex value chain underpinning the production of emethane means that both investment costs and operational expenses are relatively high. Current emethane production costs are estimated to be four to 15 times higher than Asian spot energy prices. And we also see that emitting can play a crucial role in the future system integration of low emission gases while enhancing the seasonal and short-term flexibility of the overall gas system and as such be a key contributor to gas supply security. Demand creation will be critical to support final investment decisions in emethane, with global, with global production potentially reaching over 1 BCM by 2030. I would like to thank you for your kind attention and now give the floor to Mr. Um, Kuzuki, who will give us the perspective of Japan in the emethane landscape. Mr. Kuzuki, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, the uh, screen share is not uh, per permitted. Uh, I can do it now. Thank you very much. So, can you see it? Thank you, Mr. Kazuki. We can indeed okay. see your screen. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ryota Kuzuki, the Japan Gas Association. I'm Division head responsible for international certification and standard harmonization. I'm very honored to have this opportunity to present about briefly our challenge to develop e methane value chain for carbon neutral city gas supply in Japan. First of all, I briefly talk about the JGA and our current situation. The Japan Gas Association is a non-profit organization established in 1947, consisting of about 200 companies. Our members cover about 
27 million customers, or half of the total number of households in Japan. Total volume of annual gas supply is about 40 billion cubic meter. Total pipeline length is over 260,000 kilometer. Japan city gas industry was the first mover in the world to introduce and commercialize LNG for city gas supply in 1969. Now there are 37 LNG terminals. About 50 years have passed since the introduction of LNG. In October 2020, the Japanese government announced its goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2050. In April 2021, it also set a new target of reducing GHG emissions in 2030 by 46% from 2013. Japan city gas industry is now facing a new challenge to meet the target. In June 2021, we JGA formulated and announced Carbon Neutral Challenge 50, 2050 Action Plan. This video includes the goals for 2030, 2050 of the city gas industry consistent with Japan's current basic energy plan. In 2030, we are we are going to establish a value chain, including overseas imports of methane, with 1% of methane in city gas supply. And the second step, we are going to achieve carbon neutral city gas supply by methane as main, main field stocks. And the rest of the share will be covered by direct use of hydrogen, biogas, and other, other means. Now, next, I would like to talk about the efforts by Japanese leading companies to commercialize e-methane. I'm talking about the production cost structure. The cost structure of e-methane is estimated to be much dependent on hydrogen production. This is an image. And the procurement of stable and inexpensive renewable power is the key. Production site selection is the most important. And next followed by technological factors such as large scale production and advanced higher efficient process. Now I'm showing the various efforts by leading Japanese companies. Japanese major gas companies are leading field tests. Various efforts are now underway to scale up production demonstrations, and feasibility studies of international projects. This is one. Variety of feasibility studies for largest scale, larger scale production are undergoing in the areas where plenty of renewable energy supply would be expected, which is the most critical factor, as I mentioned, for the production cost. In addition, the areas close to existing LNG terminals are expected to contribute much competitive supply chain. One of the examples I'd like to show is the Cameron in the, in the United States. Liquefaction plant existing Cameron LNG facility is here and uh, let us imagine that hydrogen production and e-methane production methanation process is located next to the liquefaction plant, it is as facilities as well as those of the LNG supply chain are existing LNG supply chain are expected to be fully used. To contribute to the target of meeting 1%, as I mentioned, of the gas demand of four large uh, leading gas companies in 2030, FID in 2025 is needed. And next important factor is the innovative technologies, which is challenged by the many companies. Major gas companies are challenging innovative technologies to improve production efficiency for cost reduction, supported by green innovation funding program by the Japanese government. There are SOEC and hybrid processes that include Sabatier reaction featured by 
this is important, direct use of water without hydrogen process, production process. And target efficiency is excess 70 to 90%. This is a target value. Commercialization is expected in the 2040s. Now I explain about the needs for internationally applicable GHG accounting rules. This is one of the keys for decision making. First of all, I would like to show, talk about the encouraging documents by the intergovernmental intergovernmental frameworks. The first one is IPCC sixth assessment report mitigation of climate change 2022 April. In the power to fuel part, it says that the electricity can be used to generate hydrogen for greater compatibility with existing gas systems and appliances the hydrogen can be combined with captured carbon dioxide to form methane. This means e-methane and other synthetic fuels. The second one is the G7 Climate, Energy and Environment Minister's Communique 2023. It has issued on April 2023. It, the carbon management part, utilization, CCU, carbon recycled technologies, including recycled carbon fuels and gas, RCFs, such as e-fuels and e-methane, also can reduce emissions with existing infrastructure. Now I'd like to talk to show one of the ISO standards. ISO 6338-1 this is entitled Calculation of Greenhouse Gas Emissions Throughout the Liquefied Natural Gas Chain, Part 1, General, was published in January 2024, which includes calculation formula which, JG, which we, JGA, proposed for carbon footprint, carbon intensity of a methane in accordance with ISO 14, 6067, well known standard for carbon footprint calculation. The core concept is that the CO2 feedstock captured carbon meets certain criteria conditions. It would should be minus counted to calculate carbon footprint in the entire boundary. I would like to emphasize that our concept of avoiding double counting of CO2 for recycled carbon fuels, such as e-methane, is accepted as one of the ISO's frameworks. Now, common problem of recycled carbon fuels is to which entity is the environmental value created by displacing fossil fuels with lower carbon intensity fuels attributed those who captured CO2 or those who used the recycled carbon fuels. In principle, the environmental value should attribute to the entity who paid for the value. However, our understanding is that commonly accepted GHG accounting rules for recycled carbon fuels have not yet been developed. Now, I would like to introduce a relating topic. In the recent bilateral meetings at the summit level and the energy ministry representative level meeting between Japan and the United States, they welcomed the progress of ongoing projects, including e-methane, outcome documents of both mentioned recognition of the private sector's agreement of to avoid CO2 double counting. We believe this would contribute to the decision making to such private sector's project decision making. Now, I'd like to talk about our interest and the challenge to develop and to harmonize international GHG accounting rules. Now, currently, our understanding is made that major international GHG accounting rules do not have methods for cyclocarbon fuels, including methane. 
And recently, revisions are expected in IPCC inventory guideline and GHG protocols co corporate standard. JGA is trying to involve the revision process through the advocacy activities and making effort to develop international standards and our own certificate certification scheme as one of the references for the revision process. Hoping that it, they will serve as one of the references for their revision process. In the, about the clean gas certificate, this is uh, our scheme. JGA now and gas related organizations have developed a scheme of certifying the transfer, certify and transferring the environmental value attributes of e-methane and biomethane produced in Japan. We are aiming the scheme to be applied to cross-border traded e-methane and biomethane. Hoping that it will serve as one of the references for the revision process, as I mentioned before. Now I am showing a goal image of value chain of e-methane with internationally applicable certification scheme. I would like to emphasize that harmonizing the internationally applicable environmental value attributes, certifying measures for recycled carbon fuels such as e-methane traded across borders is one of the most important issues to be resolved to accelerate project decision making. Therefore, we are now studying on some certifying schemes and uh, international rules. I would like to refer EU Renewable Energy Directive Delegated Act and ISCC Plus and our Klinga Certificate. They have a requirement for CO2 feedstock to produce synthetic fuels, including e-methane. Certain criteria should be met, should be met, as well as ISO 6338 Part 1, they are feedstock variety of CO2 feedstocks, for example, CO2 captured from air, of course, and CO2 emitted from activities listed under the directive uh, EU ETS and post-industrial fossil CO2 captured from industrial processes, such kind of that. So this is uh, similar, as uh, same as clean gas certificate too. And we need to know that in each rule, showing evidences is required. Now I would like to conclude my presentation with this slide. First, I talked about the challenges of the Japan city gas industry and the value of e-methane. Japan city gas industry is focusing on e-methane to realize carbon neutral city gas supply by 2050. And Japanese leading city gas companies are working to projects, working on projects to develop international e-methane value chain. Next, I talked about ex expected international GHG accounting rules revisions for recycled carbon fuels such as e-methane. Recycled carbon fuels produced from captured CO2 with to certified and uh, meet the criteria, criteria have a value that does not increase atmospheric CO2, does not increase CO2 in the atmosphere. ISO has already established an international standard for calculating the carbon footprint of e-methane in constellation of such CO2 feedstock. The document, another, another to topic is that the document agreed between the government of Japan and United States mentions that an agreement between the private sectors to avoid double counting of CO2. It is expected that the additional rules regarding, regarding recycled carbon fuels will be included in the GHG protocol guidelines and other as well. The last I briefly talked about launch of Klinga certificate, our own certificate to transfer the environmental value of e-methane. 
through the experience of various cases, it has just as, because it uh, have just established and started, this is a voluntary certification scheme. And uh, through the experience of various cases, it will expand, I believe, its scope to compliance scheme and, uh, and for those produced abroad. Now this is an end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your listening. No, Mr. Kuzuki, uh, thank you very much uh, for this wonderful presentation and for indeed giving us uh, the perspective of Japan on imitin, which is indeed one of the leading uh, forces. And and a particular thank you also for uh, for elaborating on the various uh, certification schemes and the importance of the accounting systems for uh, for for GAG missions. Um, we will discuss some of those uh, topics later in, in the Q&A session, okay. but okay. Um, now I would much. like but now I would like to give the floor uh, to Mr. Verkamen uh, from TAS. If the floor is yours. Thank you, Gigeli. Good morning to everybody. I'll start by sharing the screen. Can you confirm that you see the screen? Thank you, if we can indeed see your screen. Perfect. So good morning, good afternoon, and perhaps good evening to, uh, to some of you. Very happy to be here on this webinar. Also, thanks a lot uh, to organize this webinar because it is really showing that uh, ENG is starting to pick up. And also thanks a lot uh, to be able to show and to present to you what this is doing uh, in this environment. The first slide is already covering lots of things that have been discussed uh, by the previous speakers. I just would like to point out that we are convinced, and I think a lot of people with us, that the future energy system will be comprising a lot of renewable molecules. And the systems are today asking um, molecules and in the future we'll keep on asking these molecules. So before diving into the details, let's just spend one more minute on the synthetic methane and how it is being produced. When we talk about synthetic methane or E-methane, in fact, we talk about ENG. We talk about electric natural gas because it is made out of green electricity, whether it is uh, from sun, from solar, from wind or from hydro, it doesn't matter, it needs to be green. You use that green electricity to convert it into green hydrogen, you add sustainably captured CO2 and you mix it. And the process it was already referred to is called the Sabatier process to end up with a renewable CH4 molecule. Some of the people to whom we are explaining this process are saying, but this doesn't seem to be a very efficient process because basically you are making out of a hydrogen and CO2 molecule, one CH4 molecule, so one synthetic methane molecule and two molecules of water. So it doesn't seem to be efficient. This is, of course, correct when you look at it from a mass balance perspective. However, when you look at the energy content, it's clear that the CH4 is capturing 80 and 80% 80 plus of the energy that was initially captured or that was initially inside the H molecule, H2 molecule. So basically what is important is to not look at the mass balance, but to look at the efficiency at energy level. Moreover, if you are wisely using the energy that is coming out of the uh, exothermic reaction, because the Sabatier reaction is an exothermic reaction, you can even increase the overall efficiency of the process. So it's very important to have that in mind. Also, it has already been addressed previously. The benefits of this molecule is that it can be immediately used. You don't need to change anything with respect to your midstream infrastructure. The customer can immediately use it, which means that the entire cost perspective of the production and the delivery to the customer of your ENG, to some extent, is far lower than some people might expect. It's clear that, based on the discussions and also based on what is happening, also based on, on what Mr. Kuzuki uh, told us, that ENG, or synthetic methane, is gaining a lot of momentum. And we see all these initiatives popping up. We see that ENG or synthetic methane is getting the place amongst renewable molecules. And it is also important that we get the necessary framework around it, regulatory wise, or from a support scheme point of view, to make the market really opening. 
And that's also why I'm very pleased and proud to, to share with you that together with the companies that you see on the left-hand side of the slide, so Toho Gas, Engie, Mitsubishi, Sempra, Osaka Gas, Tokyo Gas, and Total Energies, we created the ENG Coalition. And that ENG Coalition has really the purpose to, first of all, promote ENG. So what is ENG? What are the benefits of ENG? How can ENG contribute to a smooth uh, net zero transition? So that's the first task of the ENG Coalition. The second task is to be sure that worldwide, this is becoming a kind of tradable commodity, because I think it's clear when you want to produce cheap renewable molecules, you need to do it in these places where you can have very cheap electricity and very cheap green hydrogen. And so that's also one of the big uh, topics that the NG coalition is, is working on. And for those who want to join the coalition, please, please feel free. In the coming weeks, we will be uh, having a website or you can reach out to one of the members or to me to get more information about this coalition. And it's also showing that partnerships to make this happen are going to be key. You really need to work together at different levels in order to bring the costs down in order to be sure that the tradable uh, structure will be developed. So just a, a quick word on TESS. So who is TESS? We are a young company. Uh, we are a privately owned company. And we really have one target, one mission in life is to develop at large scale green hydrogen and ENG projects. And so we do it by going into these places where we can find the cheapest green electricity, where we can also have the necessary infrastructure to start with so that we can, once the molecule has been produced, transport it to the place of consumption. And so that can be either the downstream markets uh, that we have been discussing already previously in Japan, but also in Europe or locally, even in the US or in Canada. So it's very important that we have a global scope and that we are also organized to have this midstream infrastructure being used. But it's also relevant, and it has been addressed, I think, by, by Gergeli, we need to bring the costs down of these renewable molecules. So one of the key tasks that we are also having is to look into all the different facets of the production of the ENG molecule to see where we can bring the costs down by having a smart integration between the electrolyzer and, and the methanization, so the Sabatier process, because this is really where the key benefits will be. The success of renewable molecules will really depend upon the way that we will be able to bring the costs down. We also have uh, offices uh, all over the world, as you can imagine. And uh, you see that we are ambitious because we really want to have 1 million ton of ENG by, by 2030. And so by doing so, we are developing several projects all over the world, so as you can see, whether it is in, in the US, in Canada, or in the Middle East, or, or in Europe. And all these projects have one key characteristics. They all work with partners. And I can only keep on repeating, you really need to have partnerships at large scale to be able to develop these projects. These are very costly projects. If you want to end up with, with molecules that are sufficiently uh, going to contribute, you need to develop it, as I was saying, large scale. And so the partners can be either offtake partners, can be financing partners, can, can be partners that also bring some technology to the table, but the partnership is going to be key. And so besides the projects, and we call them the upstream projects that you are developing in, in the different regions, we're also developing in, in Germany, the other part of the value chain, a kind of receiving part of the value chain, and we call it the, the Willemshaven Green Energy Park, and it's going to be receiving the ENG, so the, the ENG on its liquid form, so the LENG, and we'll also foresee the possibility to, once the hydrogen infrastructure will be there, to crack the molecule again so that the green hydrogen can be delivered, capture the CO2, and return the CO2 back to uh, the place of production. So this is really how we are developing the entire value chain. And again, the partnerships with the different producers, with the different off-takers, with the different financial is uh, key. Gergely mentioned a lot that it is a very costly molecule. And I think it's 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 fair. And it's a correct statement that it is a very costly uh, molecule. But let's let's have two observations when we look at the full value chain of ENG. So first of all, first observation is when you look at the full value chain from the production up to the customer, that the biggest costs are linked to the production of the molecule. The transportation up to the user is to some extent extremely small. This example is referring to liquefaction. So you convert your ENG into ELNG. It's representing 5% of the costs. 
if there is an opportunity to inject the LNG into the gas grids, of course, or the ENG, sorry, into the gas grids, then of course, these costs are going to be even lower. So the entire midstream part, so to say, is uh, negligible. And on top of that, whenever the user reaches the end consumer, no additional costs at his level. And so we can immediately blend it with natural gas and so on. Second observation is that when you look at the costs of the ENG or the E-methane, that most of the costs are coming from the renewable power and from the conversion of that power into hydrogen. And so more than 70% is really the cost to produce the green hydrogen and the part to produce the ENG is limited to almost 20%. So this is covering the cost of the CO2 and the cost of the, of the sabatier. So this is also then fair to say that if you look at all the other molecules, green molecules that are de derived from hydrogen, so the hydrogen derivatives like e-ammonia or e-methanol, you always will end up with more or less the same cost structure. And you can say that more or less all these molecules cost the same and with a few percentages, percentages difference. But then of course, all the rest is going to be different because each molecule, molecule is requiring their own infrastructure to transport. And focusing a bit more, because this is really key on the costs. The costs today are really, as you can, as you saw, derived by or a function of the cost of the power and the electrolyzer. The cost of the power has already come down a lot, but we are still convinced that the cost will go further down, especially the solar panels are still having the efficiency uh, increases that will lead to lower costs. I think the latest uh, tender in Saudi Arabia was, was uh, around $15 per megawatt hour, so a very low price. So we're quite convinced that we can see the cost of renewable power still further going down. And then the more important component as well, not more important, but as important with respect to infrastructure is of course the electrolyzer costs. Today, there is not yet the scale that is bringing the cost of the electrolyzers down. And so even though companies are building uh, gigawatt factories, ONMs are building gigawatt factories, it's clear that this will be the only way to bring the costs down. We see already some signals that after kind of increase, the costs are indeed coming down. And in the short term or short term or mid term, we really also expect that we will be able to reach price levels that are going to be competitive to, to biomethane. And that, that's really the first target we have in mind. Once we have low power, low electrolyzer costs, we will for a large extent already be there because as you have seen, the Sabatier costs are not really the costs that are uh, determining the overall cost of the molecule. To, to wrap up, and to some extent also referring to what Mr. Kuzuki already said, we really want this molecule to become a globally traded molecule. In order to have a globally traded molecule, we need to be sure that everything with respect to the characteristics of this molecule is clearly spelled out. That all the accounting rules uh, that determine the CO2, that was a very nice example, are extremely important. It should be clear when a customer is buying an ENG molecule that he exactly knows what he's buying, that he exactly knows what is my CI score, what has been the origin of uh, the electricity, and can I use this molecule to meet all my internal requirements uh, or all my external requirements with respect to quotas, mandates, and so on. So very, very crucial. And then of course, <clears throat> also refer to the only way to get there is to be sure that you also have a certification in place that is not only relevant at local level, because indeed every country, every region is looking into certification schemes for their own local green molecules or green electricity, but it needs to be at the global level. Otherwise, again, global trade uh, won't, won't be possible. And then as, a, as really a concluding remark, whenever we talk about ENG or E-methane, we should think we are talking about green hydrogen. And green hydrogen, if we really want to have a successful green hydrogen economy, will need to scale up. And so whenever you launch and whenever you develop an ENG project, in fact, you are developing a large scale green hydrogen project. And this might be the only way to reach quite quickly at the necessary scale to bring the green hydrogen costs down. So bear also in mind that even though this molecule, ENG or E-methane, 
is an excellent molecule to have an immediately drop in fuel, allowing to have immediate CO2 reductions, that you're also basically developing perhaps the next stage of renewable molecules being the, being the ability to have a direct use of hydrogen, it's low cost. And if you put all these elements together, I think you will all agree with me that uh, ENG or E-methane uh, will have a excellent and beautiful future. So also thanks, thanks for listening. Uh, I'll pause here and uh, happy to take some questions. Thank you so much for this excellent um, presentation and also highlighting um, um, the fact that, that we are aiming here um, to create a global uh, market for, for emethane and that we need more international cooperation to reach that. Um, you, you also alluded um, to, to the question about uh, carbon accounting systems. And again, this is a topic on which I would like us to um, get back uh, during the Q&A um, session. You also mentioned um, uh, the costs uh, related to ENG or emethane um, production, um, something on which I think we, we, we should also uh, get back. And we also received a number of questions related to, to the flexibility of uh, of emethane uh, production uh, systems, so there is a number of, of questions on which we will um, get back uh, in a few minutes uh, during our Q and A session. But now I would be very very happy to announce our next uh, speaker, uh, Miss um, Kuyala, uh, the CEO of uh, Nordic Grand Gas. Um, Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Kegeli, and, and thank you also for the excellent presentations uh, before. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, I hope it's uh, visible to you now. Um, yeah, there were excellent presentations by Kusuki-san and uh, Mr. Vekamen on the on the ENG um, uh, image and, and the options. So let me use my presentation as a case study um, about uh, my company Nordic Rain Gas, um, and, and use it as a um, like case like where the reality is with emethane and projects as our first projects are now approaching their investment decision. Why is Northern Europe and Finland becoming one of the key markets for e-methane? And uh, how does Rengas go about scaling, uh, scaling our production with our, um, uh, yeah, with our portfolio of multiple projects? Mm, Rengas is also a young company. Uh, we were established three years ago. And from the beginning, we had a clear focus on uh, focusing on e-methane, focusing on segments where where hydrogen-based fuels can add more most value, so meaning in heavy road transportation and marine, where direct electrification is not an option, and uh, also that we use this in a scalable way, so that we we can we can have a portfolio um, of uh, modular modular emits and projects. Mm, I will start by giving some of the highlights of where we are as a company today, three years onwards, uh, as not many in the audience actually know this, and, uh, and, and uh, so to get a bit, a bit better overview on, on where this market is um, as of today. So with Rengas, we currently have six e-methane projects under development. We develop all of them with local Finnish municipal energy companies whose logos are mentioned on this slide. I will tell a little bit more, a little bit later, more about how the business model works. In essence, these are rain gas projects. We pay the development costs, we make the decisions, but we have created in our value chain a close collaboration together with these utilities in terms of utilizing the uh, CO2, but also providing them district heating. Our company currently has 28 employees, um, so. I would say for a development organization, uh, we, we have quite a good crew and we have also invested heavily on building our own competencies in uh, uh, hydrogen and uh, methanation uh, technology understanding so that we can collaborate with the equipment manufacturers 
but also in, in modeling and building our own optimization, for, uh, optimization platform so that we can actually uh, analyze, uh, analyze the value drivers on this market and make these projects flexible so that they can respond to variable renewable electricity and we can get them to work according to the EU, EU regulations for green hydrogen. Uh, we are currently uh, currently funded by Allianz, a, a major German um, financial company, uh, who provided us 25 million euros of development funding in 2022. Um, and uh, our common intent is then also to Allianz becoming becoming one of the one of the shareholders in the actual assets when we make the investment decisions. Our first project will be will become operational in Tampere, uh, which is one of the bigger cities here in Finland in 2027. And I would say one of the key factors that actually sets us apart from many other developers in, in hydrogen business is that for this Tampere project, we have already signed a long term off-take agreement of e-methane with Gasum, who is a Finnish state-owned gas utility and, and active everywhere here in the Nordics. 160 gigawatt hours is the production of the first phase of our Tampere project where we have the off-take, but we have already announced our intent with Gasum to also expand that collaboration to our, our next project with larger volumes. One of the major mi milestones, and I, I think it's uh, showing well Rengas's ability to build a bankable business case is that we have already um, received an in, um, European Investment Bank board approval for 230 million euro loan framework for our portfolio of six projects, uh, which also uh, also is a kind of good showcase that, uh, that our, our way of developing bankable projects with long-term contracts is actually recognized by the financing community. Uh, and then finally, on the right hand side of the graph, for our first two projects, we have also secured a very valuable investment subsidy. As I'm sure many in the audience are wondering how expensive is this going to be. Uh, for the first projects, definitely we need uh, some public subsidy uh, because the equipment costs are still high. And for our Tampere project, uh, we have received 45 million, million euros uh, investment subsidy from the Finnish Ministry of Economy and Employment, and I will share a little bit later uh, the case about our Lahti project, where we have been also supported by the European Commission in the uh, EU hydrogen auction. If we if we move forward, uh, I will just briefly briefly illustrate uh, the business case and how we actually make the value stream work in our projects. So the starting point in all of the six projects we have is that we have a utility partner an energy company who already has an existing CHP plant. So combined heat and power uh, using biogenic fuels and, and out, of the, um, uh, out of the heat then providing district heating for the, for the Finnish cities. So in Tampere, the city of Tampere is almost fully uh, warming up in the winter time and also in the summer time with, uh, with district heating produced in combined heat and power plants. Our project is then located on a site next door, which helps us a lot because we have ready industrial sites uh, in an industrial zoning areas where we establish our, uh, our project and the production. So the first element is the uh, carbon capture. Uh, we capture that from a side stream uh, of, the, of the CHP plant. So there's just a simple pipe bridge across the road to our site where we, we can utilize the biogenic CO2. The second step is that uh, we, we have a long-term power purchase agreement uh, with wind energy producers. We transport the electricity through the grid, uh, which is allowed under the EU regulations, and, and we follow those regulations for RF and biofuel closely. We bring them to the side through the main transformer and, and, uh, and use the renewable electricity uh, to split the water molecules into, into hydrogen in an electrolyzer. Then the, the hydrogen and the CO2 are brought together in the, in the methanation unit. Um, and, uh, and in case of uh, our Tampere project, we also have a small scale liquef uh, liquefaction and, and store uh, this LNG on site. 
Some of our other projects are also located next to a gas pipeline where we can just inject the e-meter into the gas uh, network. From um, one of the key elements and that's very specific to our project, project is that uh, we collect all the waste heat in this production process, especially in the electrolyzer that does not have uh, very good efficiency. So there's a lot of heating going on in the equipment and in a lesser extent in the CO2 capture, some in methanation and that's in higher temperature. We collect all those together in our cooling system and we upgrade that heat into district heating with a heat pump. And that, that district heating is then sold back to our energy company partner with a competitive pricing and it, it uh, complements the other sources in warming up the cities. This is really important for two reasons. One, one is that it's an additional revenue stream for the projects, which helps with the profitability. But more importantly, by producing this district heating, our energy utility partners, they, they can turn off some other burning process in their system, which helps them to reduce their fossil fuel uh, use and helps them also to receive CO2 emission savings. So for us, the, the CO2 emission savings happen two ways. First of all, by producing renewable fuel out of the wind energy, um, the, the transportation sector emissions are reduced. And secondly, from the uh, district heating, heating then uh, our energy company can, can reduce, uh, reduce their own, own CO2 emissions and, and helps them with their carbon, um, uh, carbon uh, neutrality parts. For the e-methane itself, our off-taker, so for our first project, uh, Gasum, uh, then transports uh, the, uh, the ELNG with trucks and takes it to the end-user markets in, uh, in marine and traffic sectors. Finally, because Rengas developed a portfolio of decentralized projects, we have all already invested heavily in, in centralized operations and maintenance so that we can actually safely and cost-efficiently operate this portfolio uh, portfolio of, of projects uh, uh, from a centralized uh, centralized location here in Finland. Very very briefly, uh, so that we can also have time for for questions. Why is rain gas located in in Finland? And I would say that there are four key factors. Some some of those we have already touched upon uh, in the previous presentations. But what's specific about rain gas and in Finland? is that Finland is one of those locations where we have access to affordable renewable energy. First of all, Finland as a country is committed to reaching carbon neutrality, uh, and we already have a very good electricity transmission network in place, uh, which actually helps uh, renewable energy development a lot. And uh, as a consequence, and also based on some many other factors, we have one of the uh, like lowest levels, uh, levelized cost of electricity for new onshore wind, and also the solar energy prices are decreasing, uh, decreasing rapidly. Secondly, uh, the case example that I, I just uh, mentioned is that this is not just about e we are actually, uh, We are actually integrating many, many products in our proposition, the district heating that I mentioned, but also the flexibility of the production processes, which is required by the EU, but it's then also adding value, uh, value, adding value to the project, but also in our stakeholders. I have to say that it gets more complex when we have the needs for our energy utility, needs for our off-taker, and the needs for the EU regulation come into play. But that's why we have also invested heavily in our own H2 optimization platform, where we run the digital twin of our plans and, and the sub-processes to actually create value proposition uh, and the business model that makes sense for all parties. Then on the third column, of course, the existing infrastructure uh, for ELNG and e is a key driver. Here in Finland already, uh, there, are, uh, there are both compressed natural gas and LNG stations and gas pipelines that all can be used for distributing our end product. But I would say that the biggest demand for our project uh, will, will be in the marine sector where the fuel EU maritime regulations are already providing a strong incentive for ship owners to move towards hydrogen-based fuels, where uh, liquefied e-methane or ELNG is the most obvious choice, 
because it's a dropping alternative uh, to uh, in conventional LNG LNG carriers, and that's also quite visible when we compare the the rate where how um, LNG fuel ships are um, how their orders are increasing in comparison to ammonia or methanol vessels where uh, where the growth is still uh, still quite slow. Very briefly. Um, just as a kind of demonstrate, I, I mentioned on the previous slide why Finland is a good place uh, to be developing e-methane projects, why rain gas is successful. And, and it's also uh, also kind of nice to see that it's uh, that these points are being proven. So uh, in, in the first European Commission's um, uh, hydrogen bank auction, our second project in Lahti, which actually doubles the capacity of our Tampere project, was the most competitive project in all of the uh, Europe. So 132 bids, seven projects were um, were selected to be to be offered a production subsidy based on the most competitive rates. And and our lofty project was the was the top most um, competitive. Really coming down to the reasons that I um, that I illustrated on the previous previous slide on the uh, renewable electricity, the sector integration and the uh, support in the, on the business model. But also maybe most important uh, part is that we also have a standardized technical concept. So what we are doing in Tampere, we can replicate and, and replicate that with two similar units in Lahti. And we have a portfolio of, uh, of six other projects then following up. So altogether, this project that we currently have in the permitting pipeline and developing it forward with the partners. It's, it's around 600 megawatts of electrolyzer capacity um, already uh, already providing a big big part of the uh, of the expected uh, e-methane output. I think that was that was the last of, of my slides. Um, again, thank you very much for coming in and, uh, and, and listening to all of us as speakers and looking forward to a good discussion during the Q&A part. Dear Sarah, many, many thanks for this extremely insightful uh, presentation and indeed good to see um, the leadership of, of Finland uh, in, 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 in the area of Imitain. Um, now I would like to open um, our Q&A um, session. Uh, we have quite a number of questions um, related to the technological process, to um, the accounting mechanisms and systems for um, CO2, but also questions related to the seasonal um, storage of emethane. So I hope that we will be uh, touching on some of those um, questions uh, during our Q&A session. And maybe um, I would like to um, to start it by asking uh, Mr. Kuzuki, but um, please feel free to um, you know um, intervene um, in any of the questions um, during the Q and A. So, uh, Mr. Kuzuki, you yeah. mentioned that internationally accepted rules for accounting CO two uh, from the combustion of emethane are currently one of the major issues under discussion. Mm -hmm. um, when and how do you expect? this uh, to be uh, resolved because this is of course we mm. need to resolve those issues to be able to, to create a global emethane mm. or eng market okay yeah thank you very much uh, it's a very important question for us uh, we are paying much attention to the discussion on the for example ipcc inventory task force and the region process of the ghg protocol and our understanding is that both are intensively discussed for the few for years for a few years from now on. So we are taking much uh, attention on it, and we are also interested in uh, EU ETS directives and guidelines for uh, and guidelines of maritime fuels fuels uh, by the IMO International Maritime Organization which covers many fields, including e-methane, so that it is also very, uh, very important for our business. We hope that uh, those international rules will encourage the selection of recycled carbon fields, such as e-methane. So yeah, I think this is, that is all my question. 
Thank you, Mr. Kazuki. Eve, uh, would you like to yes. comment on, on that? Yeah. I wanted just to perhaps repeat a bit what I what I said previously. I think this is one of the biggest challenges that we are having is to be sure that at a global level there is a kind of consistent and coherent uh, treatment of specificities around CO2 accounting and so on. Because I think we all agree that we are talking about a commodity that will be a global commodity. So so the, the stress uh, that, that we are having as developers is that you indeed have local regulations that are completely unmatched with reality when you are producing a molecule in another in another region. So so again, uh, let me allow uh, to make a bit of a publicity around the ENG coalition. That's one of the purposes of this coalition, uh, to be sure that we are globally having a consistent approach to common problems. Because otherwise, we will only see burdens and not solutions. Thank you so much. Um... There is also a number of questions which uh, relates um, to the technological uh, processes underpinning the production of uh, emethane or ENG. And uh, some of those questions relate um, to the flexibility of those uh, processes. Um, can we comment on the flexibility of those processes and how they can accommodate the intermittent supply of, of uh, green hydrogen produced from renewable energy. Uh, maybe, Sarah, I would start uh, this question with you and then please, uh, Eve and Mr. Kuzuki, comment on, on that. Yeah, that's a, and it's a very valid and a good question um, and something that uh, has been the need for flexibility in the production process. Um, is, is both a requirement from the uh, EU regulations that we work with, but that also provides us then an opportunity to actually optimize our production already, uh, also according to the electricity market and actually uh, provide a valuable service in situation where maybe not that much renewable electricity is available or there's a tight supply situation in the electricity market. Uh, to, to also provide flexibility, also use flexibility in our production process. Clearly the most flexible part of the process is the electrolyzer itself, uh, because it's, uh, um, yeah, uh, it, it reacts very quickly to, to changes in the power level. The whole plant less so, but I think it's also quite common in uh, in other process industries that there are also so always certain buffer storages and uh, and, and uh, that, that we can then utilize to bring the required flexibility in the overall. So yes, most of the most of the flexibility we deal with the with, with the electrolyzer, the methanation itself, it's it has some flexibility, but we also also want to uh, protect it a little bit from two sudden changes and that we do with, with certain buffer storages and uh, um, other automation systems we, we have as part of our production. From, if, if you allow me, of course this is one of the key challenges that all the O&Ms are having is to be sure that the electrolyzer and the methanization are as flexible as possible and they are working on it to make it uh, as flexible as possible. Of course, the easiest solution is to have some batteries uh, involved as well. Costs of batteries are also coming down. But also, if you can if you can have your feedstock, your green electricity becoming less flexible, then, then you also are reaching the objective. And, and what we are seeing is that when you, of course, are able to blend hydropower with, with sun and, and, and wind, you already get a kind of more base load than if you only have sun or only wind. And, and also something... Uh, Quite interesting is that in the market, more and more players are starting to offer green base load power. And so portfolio players with, with different green energy sources are combining the products so that they can offer to you a green base load product that is meeting all the requirements that, for instance, are being uh, set up uh, by, by the European Commission. So there is also movement in that area. It's not only the infrastructure, but also from a, from a kind of uh, feedstock point of view, there is some, some evolution going on as well. So uh, I'm talking about uh, flexibility in the point of the transition period. Uh, there are many options to that. Therefore, uh, we are now studying on the site selection and technological development and also the some rules. It should be flex. It should be flexible 
to choose any options in the transition period, it is very important to be seamless transition. So that uh, I would like to say that uh, many options in and also it should be carefully, uh, carefully and anal carefully considered and uh, competitiveness. So uh, I would say that of course technology is important and uh, this is depend depending on the other low carbon options. So that we need to take carefully uh, think carefully about it. Thank you. And thank you, thank you so much. And um, I think also related to to the technology aspect, but but uh, more on the cost uh, side, uh, we have been uh, discussing that that this remains a, a key key challenge. Um, and we have one question um, which is related to the semester uh, semester process, which is an established process. But do we expect a capex drop? as projects uh, scale up uh, over the medium term. Um, and maybe uh, we, we could um, start uh, with you, Eve, uh, and I would also very much uh, welcome your comments, Sarah, and uh, your your views also, Mr. Kuzuki. Thank you. So when, if, if you remember, the slide that was projecting the costs was indicating the cost of the Sabatier versus so the cost of the electrolyzers. So I think if you look at the overall costs of the Sabatier on its own, it's 10 to 15%, not more of the overall CapEx costs. So it's really not there that the biggest costs uh, impact this. Today, Sabatier processes are being used at large scale in China, for instance. So they are already existing at large scale. Contrary to electrolyzers, the Sabatier process is being used uh, at gigawatt scale in China, for instance, because they convert coal gas into synthetic methane. So there is not a lot of there will be some some uh, some cost reductions to be expected especially with respect to the efficiency but the scale is already there where the biggest uh, efficiency will come is you are able to integrate much better the electrolyzers and the sabatier so that you end up with a kind of integrated uh, unit that is uh, avoiding unnecessary trans transfers and so on um, but basically that's that's where we stand today I would agree with the comment from Ian. Nothing to add. Okay. Well, um, thank thank you so much uh, for those uh, clarifications. Um, then we had, I think, one very interesting question um, related to 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 the storage um, and to the seasonal storage of um, of emethane. Um, could the panel provide any insights into seasonal storage as liquid hydrogen versus ELNG? And maybe here we could um, also elaborate on on other storage option and options uh, which emethane has, including in the porous uh, formations. Um, maybe uh, Sarah, uh, you could uh, start uh, responding, and then. And I would ask uh, Mr. Kuzuki and Eve uh, to also provide some, some comments on that. Yeah. I'm not personally an expert on hydrogen storage, but luckily there are many experts in our team who have, who have dealt with, uh, with green hydrogen and, uh, um, and storing it. We, we will also have a small storage our own site. And uh, I can just comment on the uh, amount of work that it also requires hydrogen is this very small molecule, which, which has uh, in the history and also now made it quite difficult to store. Mm, it's not to say that it could not be done, but it needs a lot of R&D, it needs innovation, it, it needs its own value chain and, and the business case to work. And definitely the, one of the advantages of e is that it is a dropping alternative to, to natural gas. We, we know how it's done. We don't need to do anything extra uh, for our lofty project. It goes into the pipeline. And if that pipeline gas is then directed to some, some kind of a seasonal storage, it's, it, it goes in there as, as any, any other product. So of course, it is, it's a very important factor of the whole proposition that, uh, that the 
distribution, storage use case, uh, and those technologies are already there and don't need additional investment. Okay. Uh, in Japan, import LNG so that uh, I should say that uh, existing infrastructure is fully used so that uh, storage, storage, so, uh, talk about the storage, I think I would like to emphasize the role of the storage of renewable power, which is varying, in varying and uh, does not uh, expected to expect it so that power to gas is one of the good storage project, storage strategy, and also the existing supply chain is has many capacity of that. So that uh, I would like to say that the existing infrastructures are enough for storage of uh, renewable energies. It may be that uh, this is the same Sarah talk, talked about. Thank you. I'll be very short because the answer is yes, it's better to convert the hydrogen into ENG and store it there because you get all the benefits that you're having today uh, from the natural gas storages. And, and I think we all start to see the consequences of the intermittency and having, having uh, a storage where you can immediately tap gas out green to produce green electricity is also a part, I think, of the future energy system that we need to develop. So, so indeed, again, the beauty of this uh, molecule ENG or E-methane is that you can do exactly the same as what you're doing today with the natural gas uh, infrastructure and power plants. Um, thank, thank you so much. And as we are approaching um, the end of our webinar, I would like um, to ask two more um, general questions, but, um, but I would be very, very curious um, um, to hear your, your views on that. Um, could you please elaborate on what are the key elements uh, which could help to accelerate the adoption of e-methane or ENG, um, both um, coming uh, with the demand from the end users, uh, but also what can be done in terms of um, regional collaboration and international partnerships? Um, maybe um, we could start um, with you, and then I would ask uh, Mr. Kuzuki and uh, Sarah to provide also their perspectives on that question. Thanks, thanks for okay. uh, the question. Oh. Ah. So I think, first of all, it's also fair to say lots is already happening. Lots of things are happening in some regions, that lie, like, uh, like Mr. Kuzuki explained. There are mandates being defined. Mandates are going to be an important element to start the market developing because it's a way to, to share the costs uh, in, in, a, in a very fair way. So also in Europe, all the regulation is being set up. All demand creators are being defined, again, like mandates or quotas. Uh, the US is, is working on it. So you see that in order to have this market really stepping up, that demand somehow needs to be created. As it is an expensive molecule, you need to be sure that the people buying that molecule have a reason to buy it. Either they want to buy it because they want to convert their operations into green operations or because they have to do it. So I think it's important from that perspective that the different uh, countries uh, and policymakers really push the market by ensuring from that perspective that there is a demand. Then, of course, whenever required, some support to develop the projects can also be useful, as we have seen. It is very complicated to build a project without an off-taker, but it's also very complicated to get the financing done. So also there from time to time, support can be required. And then of course, the international collaboration is going to be key. But I will repeat it for the last time, I suppose. This is going to be a globally traded commodity. Hence, the only way to make it work is to be sure that we set up the necessary international collaborations. And, and so I also look forward to be able to to be part of all these discussions that will lead to this international, ideally unified view on what ENG or e methane should look like, and what are really the boundary conditions around it. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it is one of the one of the keys is to 
convince uh, industrial and uh, commercial customers. I think uh, we we are now promoting natural gas to uh, advanced use of natural gas, and uh, also we need to convince customers too that in methane will gradually substitute and flexibly flexibly change it to from the natural gas because it is drop in fuel. You do not need to replace any appliances, no equipment. We sometimes call it a uh, concept uh, seamless transition. So I hope that such kind of concept is too is to uh, announce to the customers. And also we need to develop the internationally applicable rules I mentioned before in my presentation. Uh, the applicable and internationally accepted rules should be created earlier to convince customers. That is all. I would tend to agree with the with previous comments, and uh, as already mentioned, a, a lot has already been provided uh, regulations, uh, the incentives for the business case. There, there was a question I think from the in the chat on can e methane compete with uh, with fossil uh, fossil fuels and, and, and the CO two CO two capture? The answer obviously is not today. Uh, that, that's why that's why we are promoting renewable energy because the fossil fuels are harmful for the environment, but because of the current regulatory environment, they are still cheaper to use. Their true cost is not put into um, in, into the cost on them. That's why we need support for the for the renewable options. It's not just for e methane, but it's also for hydrogen, uh, methanol, ammonia, uh, all of those products. And I, I think there is a clear route, and at, at, at least for the time being, we have enough vis visibility to, to actually make the value chain work and, and to bring the first projects online. But we also need to have the visibility that, that this commitment to transform the world away from fossil fuels to the renewable ones is something that everybody wants to stick with and, and actually give long-term guidance uh, that this is the right way forward. And I think that also provides uh, the courage to all of the players in the market to actually take that little bit of extra risk that is needed when 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 we are signing up agreements for the first time for something new and 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 seeing that it's a market market developing and the, the world taking the the risk and the the extra time and and effort now. Okay, thank thank you so much. And I also need to to admit that we have um quite. A few questions uh, in the chat uh, around uh, what 45 uh, questions. Uh, some of them are quite uh, specific and uh, detailed. And um, so, um, what uh, we will do, we cannot answer them in the remaining uh, five minutes. But uh, what we will do is that we will um, share those questions with our uh, panelists um, who can then potentially uh, lies back, but also some of those questions, I find them, um, you know, quite thoughtful and also there is some interesting feedback in it. So I think those questions are indeed helpful uh, to, to thinking ahead, uh, how we can uh, better promote imitating e e value chains in the, in the coming years. Um, I would like to um, close the Q&A uh, discussion with uh, one uh, simple, uh, but uh, I think very important question is, um, what is um, what is the key advantage of e-methane over other um, hydrogen derivatives? Um, if you could guess, elaborate maybe on, on, on that point, uh, what, is, what is the aspect with which uh, emethane is is uh, really uh, winning over or contributing uh, to to the future um, clean energy systems. Um, maybe if we can um, start with you, uh, then um, Sarah and uh, Mr. Kuzuki. I'm going to give a very diplomatic answer. All all the molecules will have their place. Uh, all renewable molecules will have their place. All will depend on the business case. And the use case. And some some molecules are really very relevant because they can be directly used in their industrial processes. There is no need to convert. And think about the ammonia, for instance. 
So it's it's really dependent upon what are you going to do with your with your uh, renewable molecule. And so the advantages of each molecule are somewhere in the entire value chain. The advantage of, of ENG or E-methane is that once it is produced, the advantage is that it has uh, no, no further complexity because you can use existing infrastructure, no need for retrofitting, no need to build new infrastructure, no need also for the customers to change their own processes. They can immediately use uh, a renewable molecule that will meet all the required standards. Some other molecules have advantages in the production side. For instance, when you do ammonia, you don't need to bring CO2, you can capture nitrogen out of the air. So that's an advantage for an ammonia molecule. So again, answering this question is, is, is a difficult one because the market will dictate, first of all, what is going to be relevant and, and required. And also depending on, on the use and the use case, one molecule might be much better than, than the other. Of course, we at this, we are 100% we are convinced that converting green hydrogen into ENG is the step forward because the midstream part is so important to set up and, and it allows us to have a drop-in fuel that can in, a, in, in two, three years be used. And that I think it's also there. The urgency to have renewable molecules is there. And, and if you need to wait 10, 15 years before all the infrastructure will be in place for, for, for some other molecules, okay, then, then you lose 10 to 15 years. Uh, it was already a very good summary on the topic, but uh, fully agree that it really depends on the market and the segment for rain gas. Uh, we were focusing from day one uh, to hard to decarbonize transportation, so heavy road, uh, marine segments, and, and that really led us into e-meeting for, for that reason that there is already a use case for that. The regulation actually supports decarbonization in those segments. And, and as mentioned, the customers do not need to do uh, changes because there are already uh, LNG fuel ships and there are LNG trucks in place and the distribution. So it actually allows us to contribute to climate change mitigation faster uh, with, this, with this molecule. Yeah, thank you very much. I just repeating my presentation, uh, the key advantage is that you can use the existing infrastructure fully. You you can use it fully, and also the flexibility. The customers can can choose when and how much they can introduce e methane depending on their own needs and the situ and their own situation. So that such flexibility is one of the key advantages in com in comparison with other fuels. Thank you very much. This is all. Um, thank you so much. And um, as our webinar is approaching its end, I would like to thank you all uh, for, for your time um, and for attending today's uh, webinar. And of course, special thanks to our wonderful uh, speakers, panelists, uh, for the insightful presentations and also for, uh, for, for this very open uh, discussion about uh, the opportunities and the challenges uh, which are ahead and along uh, the e methane value chains. At the International Energy Agency, we will uh, continue to closely uh, track uh, the evolution of low emission gases, including e methane. And we have our global gas security review, which will be uh, published in early October with a special section also on, on low emission gases. We will um, have a webinar dedicated to um, biomethane also in, in Q4. And we are also uh, organizing a high level event on low emission gases. And uh, we will keep you updated on that. But in the meantime, I, I wish you a very pleasant day and uh, looking forward to continue to interact uh, with all of you on, on, on those important topics. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, thank you as well. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye.